Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. So Professor Molina is not only an inspiration for researchers in, you know, globally, but you know, his work in implementing policies, uh, it's remarkable as well. So Professor Molina, please. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to talk to you briefly this morning. I certainly would like to thank specifically Peter Raven, who has been my friend for many decades now, and certainly Jack Fishman as well, but all of you for being here. Uh, I'm supposed to talk about a bit more about the policy of climate change, but we had already such nice presentations that I'm tempted to just go and sit down over there since you have heard most of the relevant aspects anyway. But, okay, I will give you a few complementary thoughts, I hope. Uh, let's see if I can manage. There we go. Uh, I, let me start just with this a view of a certain uh, climate, certain myths in the climate change arena that I, I want to focus on. The first one being that the science is not really very well established and that there are many different opinions and scientists disagree uh, on that. That's really wrong. There have been some surveys that show for, for a number of years now very clearly that the vast majority of the experts on climate agree certainly that climate is changing and that it's most likely caused by human activities. And I stress this because we just heard uh, the concept of risk. Because climate is a complex system, so we can only talk about probabilities, not absolute certainties, but that's well known in science in general. And, and so, uh, there, there is really a remarkable consensus on, on climate change. And the few objections are that some scientists have uh, pressed on, um, we understand them very well. Uh, here, here is a perspective how they look at it. Some of the objections that we hear is, is what we call cherry picking. You can find, of course, because the science is complex, I insist, you can find many aspects of the science that remain to be better understood. Uh, that's why uh, climate scientists keep working at this. But one view is that if you find one of those things that is wrong, it's like the house of cards. The whole thing falls apart. That's what we call cherry picking. But that's not really how science works in this case. It's more like this. Okay, we do have a number of missing parts, but I Presumably all of you can more or less figure out that this is not a, a nice little kitten showing <laughs> up there, okay. So it's very clear and this, is, this goes at the essence of risk. What I want to do next, very briefly review with you some of the basic signs, since uh, we didn't hear that very clearly. Uh, and it's as follows. You know our planet has this atmosphere that is actually very thin, like the skin of an apple. Okay, the bulk of the atmosphere is very close to the surface, but it functions like a blanket. Without that blanket, we, the science uh, measurements tell us very clearly that the average temperature of the surface should be very cold, about minus 18 degrees Celsius. But with a blanket, which is this very thin atmosphere, it changes by, by about 33 degrees. This is the natural atmosphere before human activities. How does this work? Well, we get the energy from the sun. If you look at the arrows a little bit as a, as a very simplified energy balance, uh, out of three arrows, energy from the sun, one is reflected by clouds, by the deserts, and so on, but two, two thirds are actually absorbed by the surface. But now the surface emits energy, and that's where this blanket functions. It has to emit twice as much because, and there's really a mistake in this graph, there should be only, uh, out of the four going up, four, two going down. What happens is the following. Uh, the, 
energy coming in is in the form of visible radiation. That is, uh, is well known from the electromagnetic radiation. But our planet is, of course, much colder than the sun, so it emits infrared radiation. But the atmosphere is transparent to visible radiation. That's why all of it gets to the surface. But it's not transparent to infrared. It absorbs most of it. And what happens is the atmosphere absorbs this infrared radiation, and then the air molecules emit the radiation in all directions, roughly half upwards and half downwards. So that's why only two of, of these four hours eventually go out in space. But that's how it, you have a conservation of energy. And what we call thermal equilibrium, for many millions of years now, the Earth receives as much energy as it loses. It, it's not keeping the heat, as is normally understood in very simplified text. It's, it emits uh, uh, the same amount of radiation it receives, but the blanket changes its temperature by 33 uh, degrees. Okay, now, what is sort of remarkable and... Uh, uh, part of the problem is that the, the, it's, it's very easily understood why the atmosphere is transparent to infrared radiation, but why not also to, uh, sorry, to visible radiation, but also to infrared, because most of it is nitrogen and oxygen, and the remaining 1%, 99% nitrogen oxygen, is an, uh, uh, an inert gas, argon. So they are all transparent also to infrared radiation. If the atmosphere were very clean with only those gases there, it would be frozen, again, at around minus 18 degrees. But what happens, there's water vapor, which absorbs in the infrared, and there's carbon dioxide, and other so-called greenhouse gases. You can notice those are molecules that have now more than two atoms. They have three or so, but the, the two atom molecules do not absorb uh, uh, that radiation. Uh, but what is remarkable is that the amount of these gases absorbing infrared is very small. They are, of course, in the gas phase, but if they were in, in the condensed phase so that you visualize how much there is, the amount of water vapor that is con not condensed in the atmosphere would occupy only about two or three centimeters. Of course, water evaporates from the ocean, there's plenty of water in the oceans, liquid water, becomes a, to the gas phase as water vapor. And then, because temperature decreases with altitude, a lot of it condenses forming clouds. But what we are talking about in this energy balance is the amount of water in the gas phase, which, it, which would amount to that relatively thin layer. But, uh, but uh, the amount of water vapor depends crucially on temperature. So let me move on first and then come back to that. Carbon di dioxide is a gas. Uh, you know the carbon cycle, we, we exhale carbon dioxide, but we inhale oxygen because that's how we get our energy with oxidation of hydrocarbons. Sorry, of uh, carbohydrates, not hydrocarbons. Anyhow, the CO2 that is in the atmosphere is a lot less. That's why it's measured in parts per million levels. If it were to be condensed as dry ice, it would only occupy four millimeters. So that, it turns out then that that very small amount is what really determines the temperature of the planet. That's why it's called the thermostat of the planet, but because without that amount of CO2, the water vapor would condense and the planet would be frozen. But with that little bit of carbon dioxide warms up, and hence, the atmosphere can hold that much more water vapor. So in a nutshell, a very small amount of greenhouse gases is what determines the actual temperature of the planet and the fact that we are all here and that life could evolve. But here is now what you've already seen. Just to, I'll show it to you once more. How has carbon dioxide changed in the, in the Holocene? The last 10,000 years, which is when civilization uh, uh, became uh, feasible with agriculture and so on. And you can see this very sudden change, almost doubling. Oh, it's 40% more than it was for really uh, many, many years. That's an observation. That's uh, Charles Skilling, uh, 
started these observations, but now it's very clear, of course, all over the planet. The point I should have made also with this sphere that uh, uh, we can see from space that is our planet with very, this very thin atmosphere is that emissions uh, say that we make here in the United States, in a matter of months, they mix all over the northern hemisphere and in a matter of one or two years, all over the planet. And that's why this problem is global. And to solve it, all the countries in the, in the planet really need to work on it. But this is what's happening now to CO2 measurements. These are also measurements of temperature. And you can also see a little bit of cooling for the past 8,000 years. We are not approaching an ice age, at least not for another several tens of thousands of years, 20, 30,000 years or so. So this is, the schooling is very slow, but then we suddenly get this warming, which is, uh, coincides with, with the increase in, in, in CO2. Uh, <clears throat> and again, this is a global average temperature, doesn't appear to be very much about, this is now an old slide, it should, it, we have warmed already up to one degree one degree uh, Celsius. And the question is, of course, what's the connection between these two observations? And uh, it's very clear that, uh, for, for example, for the in Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has already concluded, yes, there is a connection, but we are not absolutely sure. Why? Because of the complexity of the climate. But the consensus is that there is something like 95% probability that the temperature change is indeed caused by the changing composition of the atmosphere. And let me also stress now that what is very clear now with these measurements in the ocean that Jack Fishman showed is that uh, there's a lot less noise in the temperature of the, of the oceans measured that way, that indeed there is a very sudden temperature change. So let's move on. And the, this other myth is, myth is also interesting. Uh, namely, why don't, should we worry about uh, climate change now since it's such a slow process? The worry is what will happen towards the end of the century. Well, that's certainly not the case anymore because climate is already changing. And we already saw examples. Uh, heat waves, I won't repeat that since we already saw this very clearly, the floods last year in, here in the United States, but in, in, the, in the Caribbean and so on, with uh, Harvey, Irma, Jose, and so on, Costa Rica also suffering a great deal. So th these are what we call extreme events. Okay? And here's what's happening to the extreme uh, climate events. They, their probability has increased. And here is the, the, the point. Again, because the scientific community is so careful, it was just a, some years ago, maybe a decade, 10 years ago or so, scientists were very careful and stating, we, we're not sure what these extreme events uh, are. They might be connected with climate change, but we don't have enough statistics. So 10 years ago, the situation was sort of uh, fuzzy. But things have changed. The science now has established very clearly in terms of probabilities now that these extreme events are really being caused by climate change. And the point is that it's not the case in general that any one of these events was caused by climate change. It's their intensity that was increased, okay, because we we would have had the same uh, hurricanes, uh, forest fires also, and so on and so forth. But their intensity has very clearly increased in recent years. So now the scientific community has also reached the consensus. But let's go to this uh, last myth I have here. And uh, what we're talking about is what should we do about it? Give me, give me just a second. A little bit of water. Sorry. Sorry, I've been traveling too much. Anyhow, here's the point. Uh, 
fossil fuels are terribly important for economic growth, for economic development, stability, and so on. So there is indeed a question, can we do anything about it? Uh, the economies will somehow or other not allow any changes, but that's a myth. Why? Because things have actually changed, and we do have other forms of available energy. And a few years ago, yes, it was, uh, uh, it was still a, an, an enormous question. Would it be economically feasible to deal with the, with the required changes? But the, the point is, what we have is what we have now is such advancements in technology that these changes are now becoming competitive. Their, their cost is comparable to the energy which is formed with, uh, which is obtained from uh, fossil fuels, particularly both for solar and and for uh, wind. Uh, now it's still a big challenge to be able to change. The reason being that uh, these uh, forms of sustainable energy only uh, work at certain times of the day or at certain times when there is wind or not. So there's a big challenge in, in being able to store these large amounts of energy, but there's a lot of technological progress. So the point is that it's not just the case that they are now economically very competitive, but technology keeps moving forward. So it's very likely that these two forms of energy will, will be sufficient. There are, of course, questions. Perhaps nuclear energy can help, particularly if you think about fourth generation nuclear, which is uh, really very much safer than what, what uh, we know before. For example, the Fukushima events uh, delayed a lot the thoughts about nuclear energy, but the, the, the plants that caused the, the problems were really already obsolete. So anyhow, those are all possibilities, but it does require an enormous effort by society to really do the change. We heard already about the Paris Agreement. Uh, <clears throat> this is what, uh, uh, what was agreed upon in December of 2015 by more than 150 heads of state that were uh, present in Paris. I happened to be there. Uh, I was with the president of Mexico, Peña Nieto, at that time. But fortunately, the agreement was practically unanimous. And uh, you can see all sorts of uh, requirements, but every country made commitments, uh, to, including Mexico, I helped uh, sort of defining so, some of those commitments, and also I, I had the opportunity to work here in the United States in PICAS with the President's Council of Advisors on, on uh, Science and Technology with President Obama. So the, crime, the Paris Agreement was designed so that the United States could also agree with it, and what that meant that it would have no requirements for Congress to approve it because there are, as you know, some problems with Congress not quite agreeing with, with the climate change science issue. But here is, I'm almost finished, just two more slides. Here is, you, we already saw some other forms of this graph in the, with the previous presentations, uh, what the emissions look like at the moment. And ideally, the Paris Agreement talks about at, uh, not surpassing an average two degree warming. I should insist here that it's not the average temperature that counts most, but it's these events uh, that are, are very worrisome, droughts, floods, and, and so on and so forth. But the average temperature is a simple way to talk about this. And we should really go down even to negative emissions as we just heard from Catherine that uh, if, if we really want to stay below two. Because the Paris Accord is, is just the first step. Fortunately, it has provisions so that the countries meet every uh, five years to uh, review what needs to be done. But then there is this red line, which again, it, it coincides with, with, the, with the red band that Catherine showed a few minutes ago from the IPCC. 
And that's what would happen if we don't take any measures. And that's what would happen if President Trump would have its way, because as you know, uh, uh, he retracted the United States position from the Paris Agreement. And I, I'm going to end with that. Look at what the curve looks like. And I work very closely with Ram, Ramanath, and his, we are both at the University of California in San Diego, but we've known each other for many, many years. <clears throat> and what <clears throat> we decided is to highlight not necessarily what is the most likely temperature at the end of the century, at the end of the century that we would get if we do nothing, but rather what is the chance that we would get something really un totally unacceptable. And so there is a one in 10 probability, one in five maybe, that the temperature would reach something like five degrees above what it has been for in, in the Holocene and so on. And that would, that's totally unacceptable. We just saw, I won't repeat what the sort of things that would happen, massive migrations, parts of the planet would be uninhabitable because of the uh, warming effects. But the point, I'll finish with it, the point that I want to make is the following. It's not the science that is telling us what we should do, namely together. The science only tells us what would happen if we do this or that scenario? But it is here a moral issue. It's a matter of principles. It's a matter of ethics that we cannot uh, have this uh, lack of responsibility for future generations. It is absolutely essential for us, given our moral issues, given the fact that uh, fortunately, the scientific community, the international community is very much in agreement that besides the science, we need to worry about everybody in the planet. And we need to worry about the, the future generations as well. So it's extremely irresponsible uh, not to take the measures that are needed, particularly considering that they represent no longer a sacrifice. They are not uh, going to affect the economy. We can certainly do that so there's no excuse other than sheer ignorance or the, 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 there are many sociological explanations if, if, you're, if, if what you earn depends on what you believe, that explains uh, much of it. But fortunately, we're beginning to see a change even uh, among many Republicans. And of course, we work very closely with Republicans that were in power in, in, in past administrations, George Schultz it is one of them, but there are many others. So we expect things to change, and I'll just finish one more. The Montreal Protocol, this is what I work with, the depletion of the ozone layer. Uh, that's a global problem, a second global problem, but that's solved already. So we know it can be done. All the countries in the planet agreed that they should stop emission of certain industrial chemicals that would have a, a, a global impact because of depletion of the ozone layer. The agreement is uh, working well. The ozone layer is recovering. So we know we can do it. All we have to do is we all have to work together and we all have to uh, really take responsibility not just for what will happen in the future but for what is already happening today. Thank you for, it, for your attention.